Welcome everyone again. This is Frontiers of Big Data, AI, and Analytics. I am Tomohiro Ando at Melbourne Business School. This event series is co-organized with Professor Robert Cohn at University of New South Wales Business School and Professor Valentin Zelenuk, School of Economics at University of Queensland. The mission of our event series, series is unleashing ideas and insights for harnessing the successful future of business and society. This is housekeeping. The structure is as follows. We have 30 minutes talk by Professor Men. And if you have any question, please submit your question through Q&A button. And you can upvote if other questions are great please use some thumb up button. So before I formally introduce Professor Mem, I want to provide a bit background. Data collection is everywhere. I'm teaching at business school. In business, accounting, finance, human resource, strategy, supply chain, we collect data everywhere to make a decision. For example, HR, we often may do employee satisfaction survey to understand the current climate of organization's culture. In marketing, for example, to understand consumer demand, we often do survey, marketing survey. Society as well. Governments, almost all governments, I believe, they are doing census every four years, for example, because we often want to understand the current, current situation of the society, population, and so on. Election is one of the themes today, and policy making. Referendum, there are so many data collection. And this figure, shows now global market research size. Industry side is now over 80 billion US dollars. So organizations, they are spending this amount of budget. But however, on top of that, almost all organizations, business, not for profit, regulators, government, they are collecting data by themselves. And they are trying to make a better decision. So this topic is very important. And today, we are very delighted to have Professor Ahmed. And he talks about how small are our big data. But before he's, he start his talk, I want to introduce Professor Meng briefly. Of course, he has a lot of achievement. I cannot mention everything. But I briefly summarize his background. And he, Professor Shaoli Men, he received his PhD from Harvard University. After that, he held academic positions at the University of Chicago and Harvard University. In addition to his excellent achievement, a number of excellent publications, he has served in various university leadership roles at Harvard University, including Dean of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Chair of the Department of Statistics. Now he's the founding editor-in-chief of Harvard Data Science Review. It's a fantastic journal. Before he joined Harvard University, he was a faculty member at University of Chicago. And his research interests cover a wide range of topics, including statistical theory and the principles for data science, philosophical and fundamental issues in statistics. Clearly, I read his papers when I was a student. <laughs> Clearly, he, I can touch his philosophy. It's, a, it's very good. I can see his paper. I read his papers and it's a, yes, it's very insightful to me. It educated me a lot. 
and statistical computing, computer statistics. These are also one of his research interests and signal extraction and uncertainty assessment and more. And today, again, we are very delighted to have Professor Xiao Li Men from Harvard University. And I want to pass the floor to Professor Men. And welcome. And I will stop share. Well, thank you very much, Tomohiro, that uh, for that really uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, anytime I hear that introduction, I just feel I'm getting old. That uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, you know, so happy to have this chance to uh, see. Uh, well, I cannot see you, see all of you, but have a chance to 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 talk of you. Um, I also I saw that Professor Rob Cohn is one of the organizers. I know wherever you are, that Rob, you may remember that we met actually when I was at the University of Chicago. So let me see you for a while, and uh, it's nice uh, to be able to. Uh, to, uh, to talk all, all of you. Um, my understanding is that I will be talk about uh, about uh, you know 30 minutes and uh, as uh, Tomohiro already mentioned the, the topic of my talk is really talking about the data quality and um, we have been all using the big uh, the big term called the big data and as a statisticians and I guess many of my uh, statistical colleagues would agree with me we don't necessarily like the term big data uh, because it exclusively emphasizes the quantity, not the quality. Because when people think about big data, it's just you know lots of data, which is you know people have this general notion that when you have lots of data, you must get better answer. But that's actually turned out to be really not quite true. And in fact, uh, what I want to show you today is that if you forgot the data quality issues, you can be misled uh, in a very serious ways because uh, at, the, at the end of the day, I hope I can convince you it's a data qu quantity, it's a data quality that is far more important than data, data uh, you know, quantity. And uh, since we're still inside of COVID, unfortunately, uh, I wanted to uh, start with uh, my talk, directly talk about uh, COVID-19 testing. Um, this is a one illustrative example to show you the importance of the uh, worry about the data data quality. Uh, the Harvard Data Science Review, as uh, Tomohiro mentioned, uh, is a relatively new uh, publication and in was inspired by Harvard Business Review and Harvard Law Review, but we uh, publish more than just the research and also just the uh, reach our public. But we also uh, publish data, data science education. So we basically publish research, education, as well as the general public uh, you know, outreach. Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the front page of the special issue on COVID-19, which is still going, still going on. And um, I, for every issue, I write an, an editorial. So this particular example you can find actually in, you know, in, my, in my editorial. So um, I actually wrote uh, uh, one article about this uh, uh, particular issues that are, uh, it, it's available if you are interested in, you can send me email. But actually just happened that I, uh, I published an article about this issue, about elections, uh, uh, just in a Scientific America coming out of like three days ago. If you uh, search for Scientific America, uh, search my name, you will, you will get a version of my talk, but in a most uh, uh, kind of a plain language that uh, in, uh, here I will be slightly more technical just because I want to convince you that there are hard mathematics behind them. So these are not kind of hate, you know, uh, hand-waving results. These are really, uh, really very uh, important fundamental results. And this particular COVID example I'm using actually was uh, uh, written by Ward Dempsey, a professor at uh, uh, University of Michigan uh, biostatistics. He applied a formula I de developed to the COVID situation. So I'm actually really taking his calculation and he actually has an article uh, on this topic as well. You can find in, 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 uh, in the in, in archive. So I wanted to start, uh, ask uh, the audience the following question. Now, you know, this thing, since this is not uh, a live talk that I can't see your hands, then, uh, but I'm gonna ask you this question that I want you to start to thinking about and uh, see, see how you answer this one, okay? Now, supposing in UK, we random select, we random test 1,000 people for COVID-19. Now, how many people do we need to test randomly in the US, which, which has about, you know, five times more people to achieve the same statistical accuracy for estimating the positive rate in the US population. 
So the question I pose to you is a very simple one. In UK, you say, I want to estimate how many people actually will be tested positive, which by the way, is not necessarily they really carry the COVID-19 because you know, the test has a false positive, false negative rates. But let's say we just want to estimate how many people will be tested positive percentage-wise. And uh, someone said, okay, I want to do that in US. Now US is about five times more population. So what the sample size should be that if I want these two tests have the similar accuracy, right? So here's a multiple choice question. One is say, it's still 1,000, right? 2,500, 5,000. And they're a clever answer, it depends, right? So uh, if we're doing this real uh, uh, in-person, I'll be, you know, I, I may want you to show your hands or, or, or we may even doing a, a little bit of quiz, but here, here I'm just gonna lecture to think for five seconds and you can just think about what, you know, what your answer is. Before I, be, you know, before I tell you what, uh, you know, what I'm, you know, what I'm getting at here. So um, there are actually really kind of a two correct answer here. There, there are a couple of really wrong answer. Uh, and probably the, the, the one answer most people will fall the trap is a 5,000, right? Because, you know, if, uh, if it's a five times population, why not five times? Okay. Now, anybody who has studied any statistic, you would know that's the wrong answer. It doesn't go that way. Okay, statistical errors does not go in this kind of a linear fashion, right? And uh, um, so, the the if you read the typical classical textbook, it will tell you the correct answer is still one thousand, or approximately one thousand. You don't need to change your your sample size when you change the population size. For people who have not really studied statistics, that sound must sound very odd, okay? Right? Because you know, if I study a population with say you know, 50,000 people and a study population of 5 million people, it got to be much harder to estimate things for the population of 5 million people. How, how, how can that still be the same, right? And, uh, but what I want to tell you today is, is uh, I guess this is a, a kind of a slightly cliche, you know, in those situations, the correct answer is always, it depends, okay? And, uh, uh, but the question is, is like, you know, you know, depends on what? Well, the, the problem said that if I, if I want to test everything randomly, if it's truly random, then the answer will be one cell. And I'm going to explain to you why that's the case. But in reality, and we particularly know for the COVID-19 testing, at least up to now in US, for example, we're still test people because they're more likely going to have the, going to develop the symptoms or, or more likely because they have exposed to people who have, who already, you know, carry the COVID-19. So, you know, we have a kind of a selective, you know, bias there, right? So, but I, but I want to first uh, um, to kind of share with you, how do you think about this uh, idea that in the classical statistic, it will tell you, forget the population size, you know, as long as you have enough sample, that's all we learn, right? It's a, there's a formula, you know, the variance is one over, one over N, so you come square over N, you have this formula you, 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 you know, you probably have seen. And uh, so where does this thing come from? How, how could we uh, ignore the population size? Well, it turned out to be, there's a very good analogy uh, thinking about uh, tasting soup. And I assume many of you have done that. When you need to taste a soup, right? And, uh, uh, you know, regardless the size of the container, I found this tiny soup, or I found this gigantic bucket. Well, as long as you mix the soup well, all you need is a couple of spoons, right? And that's because the homogeneity, homogeneity. because the soup is, is homogeneous. It's every piece is representing, you know, every piece else. So, so there's no reason that you need to, unless you really like the soup, you drink all of them, right? So you just need a little bit, okay? And that's pretty much is the Z reason that to why we can take a small sample to learn the population. If that a small sample is well mixed in the population. But what do we mean by that, right? In practice, we cannot really put people like a soup to stir them, right? So this is where the whole concept of randomization comes in, right? The whole concept of randomization is a probabilistic way to mix the population. So in the end, it's called everybody has equal chance of being selected. Now, a more sophisticated theory will tell you it doesn't have to be equal chance as long as you know what the chance everybody uh, gets selected is, then you have a way to do the mathematics. But for simplicity, let's just assume that everybody has equal chance. Now you can understand why that, what do we mean by they're well mixed, statistically speaking, everybody has equal chance. So whatever the, whatever the lit n, little n you get, they become, statistically speaking, it's like a miniature of the big population. If you have a miniature, just like you have a, you know, a, a, a couple of spoons of, uh, uh, of well-mixed soup, if you want to taste what the soup is like, that's all you need. 
Okay, so that's pretty much, I mean, I basically have told, told you essentially the 100 years development of the statistics, okay? In a, in a nutshell, that's how, what allows us to, uh, uh, you know, take a sample to learn about the population. And I'm sure uh, many of you in Venice, you have done those things. You have take a sample, you have looked at those things. So you, you have done this many times. Now here's the problem, right? The problem is this based on a fundamental assumption that you mix them well, okay? So what if you didn't mix them well? Well, let's think for a second. Even think about these, even think about these, you know, these buckets, these soups. You see, mixing a small soup is much easier than mixing a big soup, even just physically, okay? So you can see that when you have a large population and the mixing them is not easy, especially if the population can somehow unmix by itself. Uh, let me, let me try to tell you what that means, okay? And so then things, things just gets, you know, you know, gets very complicated. So what I, uh, I wrote an article in 2018, and I think this article has been, uh, you know, gets a lot of publicity. And so part of the reason I think I got invited to give this talk is probably, you know, because this article. And I'm gonna now share with you, I'm gonna actually really share with you a little bit of statistics tonight. And uh, I know some of you may be afraid of uh, seeing the symbols, but I wanna convince you that this is a really, a very fundamental uh, mathematical formula that for you to keep in mind, because it tells you, it's, it's a pretty much explains like most things we do. How do we have it? How can we estimate things accurately? And where are the sources of errors, okay? Now, in order to introduce this, uh, uh, this, this identity that I do need to uh, uh, provide, a, uh, you know, provide a little bit of notation here. Um, so the, the, the notation here is that, uh, uh, let me see. Okay, let me, I'm, I'm actually, I think I'm doing the, uh, doing the election first. Okay, that's fine. The, um, uh, suppose like each one person, right? You know, let's say you decide to vote a, a particular person, particular candidate. If you vote for a person, you call it one. If you don't vote a person, we, we, we call zero. It doesn't mean you vote for somebody else, okay? So it's just, we're, we're dichotomize the, uh, this answer. So that's called the, 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 the binary indicator. Now, there's another really important indicator in doing this, this calculation, which is the one that uh, typically people overlook, but, it, but it's where, where the, how do you measure you did not mix well is all in this, this indicator. This indicator is say, because you know, in these opinion surveys, people, uh, you know, ask you and, uh, uh, you know, who, who are you going to vote? And uh, uh, you, you can say who you want, who vote, or who you will vote, or you refuse to give answer, okay? Now, I'm assuming you will, you will, not, you will not be lying if you give the answer. The lying is an entirely different story, okay? But if you're not lying, you can still refuse to, to give the answer, all right? So uh, let's say if you, if you give the answer, we call it one. If you don't give the answer, it's zero. So that's a response indicator. So now think of each of you, each of you, you have a pair. You are answer, you, whether you vote for a candidate A or whether you will respond to the survey or not, okay? Since you have a pair, there is a statistical correlation between them, right? Think about cross a, a population. Now, this is probably the most scary formula you're gonna see, uh, but I'm gonna to explain to you each term because this is really very important. I also wanna emphasize in today's talk that although I'm giving you some formula, these are the most basic statistical concept. Okay, the concept that we're going to get here is there's something called a sample mean. This is simply the average of everyone you see in your sample. That's essentially to estimate what's the percentage of people are going to vote for, for A in your sample. This X bar capital N is the average in the whole population. This is how many people is going to vote for candidate A in the population. So the difference between them is the, is the statistical error, is the error you want to assess. Okay, I hope that's, that's clear. This is what you call the estimator and this is the estimate. This is how many, you know, you, because before the election, you don't know how many people is gonna vote for that, for, for a particular candidate. All right, so what I did here is to decompose, this is a mathematical identity. And again, uh, I hope you won't get scared because I'm gonna explain every term to you, okay? And in fact, that I will uh, use words. So on this left side, this difference between the two means is the actual error. That's the error, okay, you, you care about. This red part is literally the correlation between X and R. Remember, everybody has a pair. So you have a, this is a straightforward Pearson correlation. The most natural correlation many of you have, either you have learned or you have forgotten or you have used or you have seen it, okay? That's just a simple correlation. And I'm gonna call this called a quality index. I'm gonna explain that, 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 that in a minute. The, the orange one is a quantity, quantity index. The, 
on the top is how many people that are not in your sample. The bottom is how many people in your sample. So why do I call this quantity index? Well, it's obvious, this only depends on the quantity, right? And this is very intuitive. Let's say if everybody, everybody in your, everybody in the population is in your sample, this numerator is zero. If nobody lies, everybody, you sample everybody, everybody give you an answer, the error is zero. That, that's why this, this had to be zero, okay? On the other hand, if nobody is in your sample, the, your little n is zero, this mathematically is infinity. Why it's infinity? It tells you that if you're nobody in the sample, if you don't know anything else, you have no estimate. There's nothing you can do. So that's like you have, you, you have infinite uncertainty. What is the blue part? The blue part is the standard deviation. Now, some of you probably still remember the statistics. The basic quantity is the mean and the standard deviation and, or, or the variance. Variance is the square of the standard deviation. That's simply to measure how the spread in this, uh, in this population. Let's say X here is the opinion. Then it's simply saying how varied these opinions is in the population. Uh, what I, I call this difficult index because the larger the spread, the harder it is to estimate. Why is that? Well, think about the extreme case. If everybody in the population is gonna vote for the same person, all you need is to find out the one person say, who are you gonna vote? You wouldn't know everything about the whole population. So this quantity is essentially measuring how homogeneous that the population is. The more homogeneous, the, that, the easier it is, right? So these two quantities, the orange and the blue ones are easy to understand. One is the quantity, one is the difficulty. Now let me talk about this, this, this red one. The red one is called a quality index. Why do I call it a quality index? Think about what is a random sampling. Random sampling says that whether you are in my sample or not in my sample is not determined by you, it's determined by this random process. Because it's a random process, it's not, because of random, it's uncorrelated with anything else. It's uncorrelated with any, any answer you want. So therefore, if this quantity is exactly zero, if the correlation is zero, you actually will get the perfect answer. Now in practice, this is not gonna be exactly zero because the sampling, there's a little bit of sampling error, but a mathematically you can show this quantity, if you do random sample, it's incredibly small. Actually, so for those statisticians you will see immediately, it has to be on the order of one over capital N in order to cancel this, this, this big numerator. So, you know, for, for you, if you don't uh, do this calculation, all I want to tell you that you can think about this correlation on average had to be zero because, you know, whether I'm in the sample or not in the sample is not determined by me, is determined by this, by this random process. So that's all fine. Now, what, what's not fine is that if you choose R, not randomly, if you say, well, no, I am going to, if, if you, for example, R here is, is personal response, right? For example, if you choose, if say X is whether you're gonna vote for Trump or not, and you probably, many of you probably know that you know, Trump in the United States, there, it, he's not a popular figure. And there, uh, there are people who say, when you ask them whether you vote for, for Trump or not, they may refuse to give you the answer, right? Because they don't like people to know they, they, they may vote for him, but it, they don't tell you. Now, if they look at their answer, then decide not to respond to you. Even you are initially was random, it's no longer going to be random, right? Because people voting for Trump are less likely going to tell you. That induced a correlation. So this is what I meant by the sample itself, like undoing your mixing, right? Now you can see, you, now you have a trouble. Now I actually probably can already, already see, you see, if this number, even this number seems very small, when it multiply by capital N, this is the population side, Think about United States, 230 million you know, eligible voters, or even you know, this year has 160 million people voted. You can see this is a gigantic number. As long as this one, this red one is not, does not cancel this thing, this arrow is gonna blow up, okay? So this is what this fundamental identity tells you uh, why, why you will have a trouble if you don't mix well. Now, just to illustrate how bad this can be, I'm gonna, you know, uh, uh, show you, uh, you know, I'm going to, to, to you, know, uh, you know, to do the following, okay? I'm using uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, uh, COVID testing example. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do is to do the following. Now this takes a little bit of uh, uh, mathematics, but, but it's very easy for me, uh, you know, it should be easy for me to, to uh, you, know, to, uh, you know, to explain. What we're gonna do is that once we have this particular correlation, okay, which is that thing destroys the randomness, that you, you can ask yourself, okay, once you have the correlation, you know your sample size is gonna be reduced. 
Now, now you ask yourself, how much, what's the reduction of the sample size such that the arrow from the estimation I'm doing with this, this kind of biased sample is equivalent to an unbiased sample. What would be the sample size there? So these two samples will produce statistically the same error in, you know, on, on average. So one is, a, one is a sample with a sample size, let's call it, you know, uh, with a call effective sample size. That is a sample size that you, know, you will get if you, if you implement this, this random uh, survey without any, any selection bias. The other one is a biased one. But the bias that is measured by row is, 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 is this particular row. And the question is, what would be the equivalent of sample size? Using the formula I developed, you, you can show the effective sample size equals to this formula. Now, the formula is slightly, maybe slightly scary, but there's two, only two quantity. One is directly one over that correlation square. The other F here is the fraction. That you like, what was the, it's little n over, over the capital N. Is what was the, your original sample in terms of fraction? So let me give you an, an example. Okay, this is what this one actually was done by uh, by uh, 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 Ward Dempsey. He actually used my election example. I'm going to show later. So um, think about New York State. New York State is about 20 million people. So let's say we we try to conduct a COVID-19 test. So we do. Let's say we test 10,000 people. So that rate F is, a, is roughly one out of two, 2,000, okay? So basically say we test one out of every, one out of 2,000 2, people. Now let's assume there is a half percent correlation, okay? It's not even 5% correlation. It's a, it's a half percent correlation. What's a correlation? The correlation is created by, because, because we did not have enough tests, we were giving tests to people, we think they're more likely gonna have it. So that induced the correlation, okay? But let's say the correlation is, is actually seems quite small, right? Half percent correlation, as many of you use that. If you, in your uh, uh, studies or in your decision making, if somebody tell you, oh, there's a half percent correlation, you say, well, that, that, that seems negligible, okay? But now let's just put in this formula to see what the half percentage, half percent will do. What's the damage it will do, okay? So now, you see, this is the scary part. So remember the F is one out of 2000, so it's 0.05. I put it here and this row itself is, is half percent. You do this calculation. If you still know how to do arithmetic, you will get you will get the answer is about doing twenty random tests. Okay. So this is what I want you to think about. I want this to sink in. That's why I'm showing you this mathematic formula. If I didn't show you, you would not believe this. You would not believe this without. What I'm saying is that for the purpose of estimating the positive rate in New York State, which has twenty million people. If you conduct a test with 10,000, that's quite a bit, right? But unfortunately, because you have this half percent correlation, that is equivalent to you test 20 people, but truly randomly. In terms of statistical accuracy for estimating how many people in the population actually will be test positive. So what you see here is a 99.8% loss of sample size. And this is due to something what I call the law of large population, which I already explained to you a little bit. I'm going to return that as well, because it's going to multiply by the square root of the capital N, which caused this enormous damage, all right? So again, again, this is the one reason I want to show the mathematical formula, because you were, when I initially get these results, people ask me, Mr. Shadow, you, you, you are crazy, because this is, this is just hard to believe. But here, there's a hard mathematics to show you. What, what's happening here. What this says is that assumption of well-mixed is extremely crucial, okay? When it deviates from it, when, it, when, it, when, it's, when it's there, everything's fine. When it deviates from it, the larger the population, the more this bias is gonna, is gonna you, you know, kill, you, you know, kill your results, okay? So um, now for those statisticians there, uh, I'm just going to show you very quickly how I get these results, okay? And it, because, you know, otherwise you don't believe me, but uh, this is for people who are not, uh, instead, you don't worry about it. I'm just going to show you, this is a mass, this is a mathematics. This is actually, uh, there's no approximation. These are simple. Essentially, you write things in terms of the, you know, ratio of average. And for the key thing is for those to recognize the average of product minus product of average is the covariance. Once you have the covariance, you standardize the correlation, then you do all the risk calculation. I'm not going to go into detail because I understand uh, most of you uh, probably don't want to see the formula. But again, I want to make sure you understand 
this is not a, this is not an approximation. This is not any story. This is not an assumption. This is a hard mathematical calculation based on this uh, this uh, you know this identity. Okay. So now let me do quickly uh, what I did initially was not for COVID te testing. Obviously, when I wrote this article, actually I wrote this article really before twenty twenty even before twenty sixteen election. I was working with the U.S. Census Bureau. They asked me this question: How do you uh, compare a five percent random sample with eighty percent of a of a administrative data? How do you how do you do that? And that's why I started working on this. But I did a, a work on this uh, 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 this uh, when I by the time I finished this article, published twenty sixteen election already happened, and at that time it was quite clear that there was serious bias in in these pools because the pool was predicting you know uh, Clinton was winning, and in the end, as we and everybody was, you know, was surprised. So I wrote that article, and uh, there's an actual application for the 2020 election. Unfortunately, as many of you, that 2020 election pool itself uh, is 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 also still, you know, very biased. Um, so let me just go quickly that in terms of 2020, 2020 2060 election, that uh, I used this uh, YouGov data, and uh, of course, the best part of election is after it happens, that you would know the truth. Therefore, you can back calculating. You, I mean, you can back calculating uh, what what the coalition is. So this is this is exactly the same identity. Okay, so I'm not going to repeat that. I'm just saying I apply there for the COVID testing, but you can apply here for the election as well. Exactly the same identity. I'm going to do exact same calculation, except because the truth is known, I can back calculate what the row is. So I'm going to show you that this this is the striking part. United States, as you know, have 50 states plus a DC district. So we calculated this row for every state. So for, for estimating uh, this, this uh, for, uh, uh, when we ask people whether you would you vote for Clinton or not, you know, once, once we, after election, we would know the truth, we can back calculate what the correlation was. And for the answer for about a Clinton, you will see that this 51 correlations, they centered you know, pretty much around a zero. You don't expect them exactly zero. They're, they're, the, they're the spread. It's, it's, it's a nice distribution uh, around a zero. But this is what you expect when, it, when the sample is kind of random. Here's what happens. When you shift the question to about uh, for, for Trump, you see that the shape is more or less similar, but now it's shifted. It's a shifted up by a half percent. That's essentially what the word Dempsey borrowed at a half percent. So this half percent for the 2016 election was a real half percent. It's a, it's a minus sign because you know, everybody underestimated the, that the Trump was vote, uh, you know, you know, uh, vote, vote he, uh, he got it in the end. But it is this half percent correlation caused all the trouble. Again, I'm gonna repeat exactly the same calculation as before. How much trouble was caused by this half percent? Well, it, it would be exactly this, this, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, this same formula. Now, I'm going to take a 1% of the population, 1% uh, of the voting population. That's about 2.3 million uh, you know, people. I did a rough calculation before the 2016 election that roughly all the surveys all together, there's about up to about 1% of the population. We kind of have, have their opinion. It's a little bit of overestimation. If you have a 23, uh, uh, if you have 2.3 million uh, you know, answers for, for your survey, that's about like a 2,300 pools, each with about, you know, thousand people, right? That's a lot of pools. Uh, but if you put this, this, this calculation as I did before, you, you will see that 2.3 million people's answer is effectively equivalent to about a survey with 400 people, if, they, if there's no bias, okay? So again, that is the 99.9.8%, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a sample size reduction. And uh, the, the real lesson here is, of course, you say 400 people, you know, a pool is still could be pretty accurate, it would be very useful, very much so, I completely agree. My point here is that your confidence is very, very different. Imagine you're working as a, as a campaign manager. If somebody tells you that, hey, we have a great pool, 400 people, and tells you, tell us that Clinton is going to win. Well, you're not going to stop there saying, okay, we're done. But if you have heard somebody, if you have got, you got, you collect like a 2,300 pools, each has 1,000, if they all tells you Clinton's win, you say, oh, that's pretty much done, right? Because, you know, uh, the opinions is so strong, right? But I just show you, I just show you, and we use real data, 
mathematically or statistically, statistically would it really happen that 22.3 million answers, statistically speaking, because this hidden uh, self-selection bias, people choose not to answer, that is equivalent to, uh, you know, into 400. So that's the kind of lesson that, that we really need to, uh, you know, we really need to learn. So, uh, so the point I want to make is I said, I, I call this big data paradox, right? If you don't take it, the data quality into account, then what happened is the, the bigger the data, the, the sure we fool ourselves. Because when you see so much data and they're all biased, they're all centered at, at the location, you have no chance to get out of that because you're so convinced that's the right answer. And why this happens, as I just showed you, this is what I call the law of large population. You have you ever heard about law of large numbers, but this is law of large population. This is essentially this so-called Z-score, which is the arrow, this is a standardized arrow I've shown you in the, on the next slides. The key thing to take home uh, message is this correlation, its effect is multiplied by the square root of the population size. And that's where the larger the population, the more errors you're gonna have if you have a biased sample. So when you deal with lots of uh, uh, large data, you actually have to be particularly careful with the bias. And the statisticians all know that, right? With lots of data, people say, oh, we don't need the statistics anymore. In one sense, it's correct because the sampling variability is so tiny, right? When they have lots of it, it's very stable. But the problem is when the sampling variability is so tiny, what's dominant is no longer the sampling variability, but the st it's, it's the systematic, uh, you know, systematic error. But the measure, what I just talked about today, everything I'm measuring, I'm using correlation, mean, variance. These are, these are entirely statistical terms, okay? So we can still, you know, still use this. Let me just show you this, then, then I probably should stop here. I do have a little bit, few more slides I can use to answer question. But this is the real evidence to show you what I call the law of, law of large population. This again, take the 2016 data. What I plot here is each dot is the, is the is the is the z-score z-score is essentially the error divided by the the benchmark you know standard deviation and uh, if everything is random you should see everything you know 95 percent of them should be in this uh, uh, in this gray band this is called a plus minus two errors and many of you probably have done that right everything you say well there's a margin of error you know essentially this is like a margin of error but what i did is because with the understanding of this uh, phenomenon of, of law of large population that I plot these errors against how many people actually voted. This is, uh, I, I use the log scale because it's, otherwise it's too spread. So I plot against the log of total number of voters. Guess what you see here, right? You see the, the larger that state, the larger the errors. And that's a phenomenon that people did not realize because nobody plot those things against how many, because people you know, remember at, at the beginning, we say, oh, forget the population size. It's all your sample size matters. But here I just show you how important it is to understand the error actually goes up with the population size. And this is the clear uh, uh, indication of the effect of law of large population. Now, uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the data for 2020 yet, as you, you all know that the 2020 elections, although it's done, it's still being debated. The numbers are still not there yet. Uh, I will be recalculating this for 2020, but I'm very sure I'm going to see a phenomenon like this, it, just because this is this 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 law is is a mathematical law, just like a law of large number, just like a central limit theorem. You're going to see these uh, these effects if there is such a, a you know correlation. And remarkably, what this says is that correlation is pretty stable from state to to state. If each state has its own correlation, we, we may not see this so, so clearly. But you know, people have the tendency to this kind of shy, what they call the shy uh, Trump effect maybe exists pretty homogeneously. And, and, and so that's the, that's the kind of a, 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 you know, issue here. So um, I have these uh, slides about what are the lessons learned, but I think uh, I'm gonna stop here because I think I'm running out of the, uh, already exceed the 30 minutes. Oh, you can continue, please. Uh, I'm, okay, so the, I'm just going to talk about what are lessons learned. Probably along the way, you know, answer these questions, you know, as you know, as well. Um, so all I just said is here, like in these two cases, right? What do we learn from these two cases? Well, I think that that's the most important ones. I think along the way, I probably can answer this some question, and 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 feel free to uh, to ask me more, right? Um, I think I want to just emphasize to all of you again. Uh, I cannot emphasize this uh, strong enough data quality is far more important than data quantity, okay? And I think this has lots of business uh, uh, implications. 
uh, what I'm saying is that I, not only for business, for government, for 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 others. You know, I, I give a talk at you know at the United Nation. Uh, all these countries say, do we still need to collect you know data? Can we just use all the uh, online data, administrative data? I say, well, yes, you can, but you need you need to understand this uh, this phenomena that it may really worthwhile to invest invest to collect good quality data, small amount of good quality data, probably takes less money to invest than collect a lot of data if you don't know what you're doing because their statistical accuracy is not only the same, sometimes it could be even much better, okay? So, so I think that, that you know, that's, that's a very important uh, point. The second point is related, I wanna say, compensating for, compensating for quality with quantity is a doomed game. Now, initially, when I started doing this, people tell me, say, Charlie, you know, we know all pools are biased, right? There's always bias. I mean, nobody, nobody believes everything is, is, is perfectly random. There's always some bias. And then the question is, well, maybe a little bit of bias, that's fine. For example, that example I just gave you, like if you're testing 10,000, and I tell you, yeah, these, these tests are bias, it's okay. Maybe it's not 10,000, maybe, maybe, maybe 5,000, maybe 1,000. Right, you, you, you can take this discount kind of fact. You say, well, you know, I'm cutting down. Now, until I did this calculation, in the end of the answer is 20, I would not, well, I would not definitely not say, oh, it's only worth 20. Because if I didn't do the calculation, nobody would have believed me. They would shout, that's too dramatic, right? A, a half percent correlation, how could that kill like a 99.8% of population, uh, the, you know, sample size? But this, this shows you that this, this phenomena is, 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 is a really very devastating one that you really have to understand. Trying to increase the quantity to overcome these hidden bias, the selection bias is a really doomed game. Yes, if you eventually, you know, if you get 100% people, of course, you, 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 have, you will get no, no error, assuming everybody, the answer is, 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 a, you know, is, is honest answer. But what I'm saying is that you need, you need a very large pop, very large sample, so large, in order to compensate this kind of a bias. So if you have a way to cut down these bias, it's a much, much uh, a better strategy, right? So, I, so this, this is what I said, it's a far more important to reduce sampling, to reduce sampling at a non-response bias than, than non-response rate. Typically in practice, people say, oh, you know, let's try and just reduce the non-response rate. Well, that's important, but remember, uh, it's not the rate matters. Even you only have 1% of the population or even in these surveys, essentially a tiny percent of population, as long as it's, it's a, it, it, it does not suffer these non-response bias, it's still far better than, than those, you know, had these, you know, had these bias, uh, you know, bias in it. Uh, again, I'm re repeating myself, investing small but a very high quality survey and live survey with uncontrolled, uh, uh, which, you know, will be, you know, will, you know, will be much better. Uh, this one is also really very important, particularly for those uh, so for analyzing data. Suppose you, you're combining data from multiple sources. And uh, let's say, you know, you, you, you have a very large data, covers 80% population. You have a very tiny data, covers maybe only 1%. And often, currently, most people say, well, who cares about the 1% or maybe even less than 1% because it's completely going to overwhelm the, by the 80%. In fact, the, so far, the vast majority of statistical methods out there, weighting by variance, by all kinds of stuff, is going to, is going to completely ignore that the small ones, just like that. This, this uh, uh, election 2016 example I, I show you, right? If you were giving a sample with 2.3 million people, the other give you 400. Who's going to pay attention to the 400? Because you know you. But I just show you, okay? If you want to, if you understand the quality, in fact, the 400 is is a is the same amount of information as the 2.3 million. So you should have weighed them equally, in you know, instead of throw them away. And in reality, probably none of us would do that because we did not understand this phenomenon and we don't know how to you know, measure those things. But I just want to tell you again that uh, it's so important for uh, you to pay attention doing your company or somewhere. If, you, if there is a really good quality uh, uh, data, even it's a small amount, you, know, you should pay attention to it. Don't just discard it because, because it's size seemingly, you know, you know, seemingly so small. Um, the other lesson where you learn, you, you probably see that the formula, everything comes in terms of this little f. There's a little n over capital N. What that means is that for this population uh, estimation, what do we mean by big is not the absolute size, but the relative size, okay? So if somebody say, I have, I have like you know, 100 million people, well, 100 million people probably is a very large number, but you want to ask like, you know, is out of 
7 billion people or it's out of what? I mean, that whole population size really matters because of this phenomena of the, uh, you know, of the law of, pop, uh, you know, law of uh, a large population. Okay. Um, so, well, unless you want to see how to do for the 2020 election, that, I, that I'm going to stop right there and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelly. Um, it's an insightful talk. It's, um, can, can you please stop sharing the slide? Yeah. So from now, I want to start a conversation with Professor Shaoli Men. And um, if you have any questions, please use Q&A button and please post your question. And in meantime, I want to proceed a uh, conversation because uh, first of all, his paper is always insightful. Typically, the, although the concept is simple, but it's very important to our life. So for example, in, if I share my real experience, that's quite often when we do survey, response rate is let's say 20%, 30%. And then in the end, someone calculate the mean, they based on the, this calculate the mean, they often make a decision. That's quite typical. And um, yes, these are very important. And uh, so housekeeping, please submit your question Q&A uh, by Q&A button. Please upvote other questions by using thumb up. Now, before I ask some questions, I want to kind of wrap more up, up and associate with the business typically. So what would be the implications to us, business and typically organizations, big organizations, regardless of the size of organizations? The quick remind, something I came up with was uh, HR survey, human resource. Quite often the department of HR, they do survey, annual survey. Typically they want to understand employee, employee satisfaction. Whether because employee satisfaction would influence our customer satisfactions and so on. Of course, this will also influence the retention rate of our current employees. So it is very important. But quite often we often observe is we never have, of course, sometimes may have, but almost all cases, we never had 100% response. That's the issue. The same logic, the story applies here. Also marketing. Again, when we launch, design a new service or product, we often do survey. Do you like this service or product? Can you evaluate? Quite often customers, they provide higher rating than what they think, but this is typically observed. And um, even public health, like testing coronavirus infection, is same, same logical. There are so many applications, I cannot count. It's countless. And uh, also we learned honey formula. Accuracy is data quality, data quantity, and data difficulty. And uh, from, from my, my question first is, in practice, typically this data quality, it's uh, intuitively, it's, it's very hard to, assess in practice. And then typically I read your paper, insightful, insightful paper, data defect measure, it is defined there. It's very important. 
But how can we measure the quality of data? Can you share your thought, opinion, advice to us, shall we? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, thank you for the great question. Yes. You know, I want to first say there's no free lunch, right? Because if you look at the formula, you would know that if I know the data quality, because data quality is easy to estimate because it's the ends we know. And the problem difficulty is just a variance standard deviation. You can estimate from the sample. You pretty much can get, get almost the, the exact answer. So you know that, that in general, you cannot really estimate data quality from the sample itself because remember that was a correlation, right? But for everyone in your sample, there are equal to what by definition. So you never see people who didn't come to your sample, right? So you will say, Charlie, that just become useless formula. Well, first I want to say, uh, the reason you write down decompose this thing is to understand where the errors come from, okay? Now you say, okay, now the question is, how do you assess the data quality, right? So the way you do it is, okay, take a, think about what I did for 2016 election. Now, that was a lucky situation, right? The lucky situation in a sense, because I, afterwards I know the answer, okay? So I can calculate the data quality. But here is a statistical uh, trick comes in, right? Now you use the historical data. Now moving to 2020, I can use the 2016, what I learned about the correlation, right? Now, of course you say, well, shall you be careful? 2016 and 2020 is a very different. It's a different election, right? So you have, you have this usual caveat, but, you know, you know, extrapolation, so on and so forth. But in fact, that uh, uh, if if later we have time, I want to show you that 2020 election results. We actually used that to do. We did it really quite well because you know it's still the same Trump. It's still people still have these bias. You 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 learn those things, okay? So the so the answer here is that there's really uh, are two kinds of answer. One is you learn from the historical data, okay? We now now we know how to measure this thing. You can go back. We now actually go back to 2012, 20, you know, 28. It's, it's not different than any other statistical methods. Like you use historical data to estimate relationship, then you use that to predict the future, okay? Number two, remember the formula. In order to take the role, I need to know, I need to get an estimator for the, for the truth. Now, I may in the following situation. I may have, I may have this gigantic online self-report uh, data which I know there's a bias there, okay? I don't know what the bias is, but I may be able to conduct a small survey, get the really accurate estimate, really, no, the, the estimate itself may not be uh, very precise because, because, it's a, because it's a small sample, but I can, there's, I can, you know, ensure some unbiasedness for my estimator. If I have that unbiased estimator there, I can plug in this formula, I can get an unbiased estimate of data quality. Okay, I'm basically using, so this allows you take, uh, you know, invest in some small, uh, uh, you know, studies and use that to make adjustment for the large study. Okay, let me give you a specific example that people do that. And it, this, this is not my invention, but, but it has a great application here. Uh, there are these studies about, you know, the, 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 the weight, a person weight and how much the person eat, okay? Now you say, well, you know, we all know that if we eat too much, we've got all kinds of problems, right? High blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, uh, you know, weights. No, so people are trying to study those things. Well, study those things are not easy to determine, to measure how much people eat. There's an there's a, there's a easy way to collect the data, but the data are terrible. Is you, you ask people to tell you what they have eaten, what, what they eat yesterday. Like a, there's a food diary, okay? Now that is known to be a terrible, terrible data. Guess what? Well, first, I don't even remember what I eat yesterday. And the second, uh, particularly for those that are eating a lot, we don't write down everything we eat because we don't want to believe we have eaten so much. We, whatever we write down usually is, a, is, is what we think we should have eaten instead of what we actually have eaten, okay? So how do we know that? Well, the way to know that is now you can conduct a controller study Having people, like you follow a group of people, a much smaller group because it's much more costly. You actually, whatever they eat, you actually weigh them, you give them measures, you give, you know, so you get a much more accurate measurement there. So you can use that relationship, a small sample, okay? Use that to correct this large sample. In the population, you can correct a lot of things. Then you will see there, there's definitely a, a very big bias. So you have these kind of a combining these studies 
And that would be a similar situation here because I, I don't know what the, what the bias is in my large population to feel self-report, but I can invest to do a smaller study much better. Now that self could have bias too, be careful. When you, when you measure people what they eat, they tend to eat much more carefully. So you need to make sure that, has a, that may, not, may not be generalizable as well. That's what you know, statisticians, you know, we worry about all these issues, right? But you can see how we go about those things. And, uh, but the most important thing here, my first uh, in reason I do this is to raise the awareness that this is a quantity you want to measure. Because this quantity measures, this quantity measures both publicistic sample or non public sample. And if you can get a hold, if you can get some sense of this data quality, that give you tremendous insight. And then you learn from one study, you might be able to generalize to another study. And that's, the, that's what you do. Now, this is just the beginning of this kind of research. So I'm also encourage others that others start to working on this thing, take this measure and trying to come up with all kinds of things to do. We do that. I mean, statistical analysis is always about estimating something we don't know. And we have come up with so many different ways to do those things. So I'm very confident that we can build this thing once now we recognize what we should measure. Yeah, thank you. It's, it's uh, what you described, suggested, sounds feasible in practice. Right. And uh, it's, uh, it's because uh, HR survey, for example, every year they do survey. As long as they don't change strategy dramatically, their culture kind of um, culture climate yep. will, wouldn't tend to change too much within one year. So in that case, by using small sample, calculate past data, historical info, we yep. can definitely measure the data quality. So yeah, we yep. can apply this logic to wide range of area. Oh, it's a very, it's very nice. And because yeah. I have a lot of questions to you, yeah, and I want have, to, you know, we 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 have time, right? We we're just, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we have, still a, have a half hour at least. Yeah, so I'm yes. happy to to answer this question. Yeah. So now, <clears throat> so this I just want to dig into more details a bit. The this figure is a typical market research, okay. regardless of big data era or not. We clarify our problem, what do we want to know. Second step is research design, how do we collect data, what kind of measurement do we use and so on. Then step three is data collection. And then data analysis and we report some finding to maybe C-suite executives, board, directors, managers, boss or society or the target audience. Yep. I agree that there, there may be a variation of this flow, but in general, we follow this flow. Mm -hmm. Let's assume we employ this flow. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask, uh, what kind of points may affect market research process in general in big data environment? Mm -hmm. And typically that influence reporting output because uh, there are so many points i want to we want to learn from you yep so uh let me uh i really appreciate your five steps here uh on the harvard data science review there's an article by jeanette wing in the first issue she has this even longer chain you know it's this <laughs> whole what do you what do you call the data life cycle and uh by the way, the Harvard Data Science Review is entirely free, so uh, you, can, you can search for it now, you can search it even now, okay? But, but what I want to emphasize is that I'm really glad that you write down this whole thing because typically, right, up to now, uh, most of what we call the data science people working on is, is the kind of number four. Is lots of things is about machine learning, uh, statistical methods, you know, AI, uh, neural network, deep learning is pretty much about, you know, give me data, I run something, okay? I do pattern recognition. There are a lot of emphasis on the data analysis, which is important. But as you just show here, that's number four, right? If number one, two, three falls apart, number four is useless. Not only useless, it could be completely misleading, right? Okay, so let's from number four, look at number three. And that's exactly what I was talking about, right? Data collection is so fundamentally important. Now, 
um, the, uh, the other step which uh, Jeanette will put in between three and the four is the data processing, pre-processing, right? After you collect them, you need to clean them up, okay? And to clean them up itself is a tremendous amount of job. And for anybody, any real data scientist, I would know that they spend probably most time to clean those things, to make them usable, okay? And there is actually have lots of problems because in the process, you make a lot of judgments. And there's not any grand theory about how you, the grand theory, how to analyze the data, like the probability theory, like what I was just telling about. Pre-processing data is like the wild west, you know? It's so, I actually wrote an article about do pre-processing. It's so hard to do this theory because, you know, any sort of, sort of anything goes. So there, there are lots of judgment made, made there. So I think that that's, that's also a part of data quality you really have to pay, pay attention to. But goes back to data collection, the problem I talked about here data collection was, it was a well-intended data collection, like a random sample. But unfortunately, people can undo that, right? Okay? You know, so that's where, that's where, where, where the problem is. So, so you need to recognize that. But I want to say that I'm glad that you also said that the research design question itself is very important because, you know, if you ask the wrong question, you're just not going to get the right answer. That's obvious, right? And in fact, I want to give you an, an example. Even you ask the right questions, depends on which order you are asking these questions, you can get a very different answer, okay? Years ago, I did a study with a group of psychiatrists, psychologists. They tried to study the mental health. Like, you know, what kind of service people use when they have a mental health problem, all right? Now, mental health, as many of you know, it's a very complex, uh, uh, you know, in a subject. Different cultures may even, some culture may not even believe there is a mental health issue, okay? And um, so this, this group of, of, of psychiatrists and psychologists, they work with me because you know, I do this survey stuff. Okay, so the, the one, uh, one study leader, uh, Maggie, uh, she, she, I mean, she's really great. She recognized that the traditional way they're collecting data, they had a problem. So what was the problem? They asked these uh, potential uh, you know, patients, they asked her say, uh, you know, in the last year, um, did you go to see, uh, you know, uh, did you go to see a psychologist? Okay. And if you say yes, they, they have a follow-up question. They, they say, okay, now why did you see the person? How long did you see it? You know, for what reasons, right? Okay. They finished the question of, uh, of psychologists. Then they ask you, in the last year, did you see a psychiatrist? Okay. If you say yes, there's a, a follow-up question. Okay. Then after that, they ask you, uh, uh, you know, did you see a social worker? Did you seek some you know, religious help? Okay. So guess what? After a little while, the person realized, if I said no, they would not be asking me all these questions, right? So, so, so then, so what they happen is they see in the traditional survey, they always start with like, you know, doctors, psychologists. By the time they get to like a religious service and the social works, it's a bottom, like the question 13. And the survey always showed that there are very few people use religious service or, 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 social, or, or, or social workers. And they know from the kind of anecdotal evidence that a lot more people use these surveys. But the surveys always show like very few people to, to, to use them. So this investigator, she realized the problem. The problem is the way you ask these questions. So guess what she did? She said, okay, she randomized this survey. 75% uh, of people, she asked the older way. Okay, there's a reason why she asked 75% people because she does not want to, this uh, results to be too different from the traditional one. The 25% people, all she did, she changed the question. She didn't change any question wording. She just had the first question says, did you see a psychiatrist last year? Yes or no? Did you see a psychologist last year? Yes or no? So she just asked that question, finished the question. Then she looked at it and said, oh, now you said yes. Now I'm gonna ask you these things, right? But then the person, when they realized it's too late, they already said they have seen those prisons. So when, then she gave me the results, right? For all these 13 questions, the new way of answering it, right? Except the first one, that the rate is uniformly higher than the older way, right? It's a very simple example about, it's not even changing the question. It's just about how you ask the question, 
you get very different answer. The answer like in the end was like three times more, five times more, right? And you see how, how scary this was because for years, for decades, the whole, pop, whole literature in that study, in that field, all used the old, older way of uh, doing the, these things. The simple change to basically that 20 year research, lots of things are wasted because you're just using the wrong data, right? So I think that's just absolutely important about the research design. And uh, there, there's a huge literature on how you design the question, how do you ask, ask them, how you even like doing interview is also very important. Whether you have, you know, who are the interview interviewees, you need to be, you, I mean, you need to be very careful. Certain questions when you have a man ask a man or woman ask a man or man ask a woman, you get a very different answers, right? There, there are all these arts in those things. Uh, traditionally are not emphasized by kind of a data scientist. They, they are regarded as like a social scientist's job, right? The survey scientist. But I want to emphasize just like, no matter how fancy deep learning everything you have, when you have that kind of a, you know, bias the results, unless your algorithm knows how to correct them, you will never get it right. And that would directly affect your, your answer, directly affect how you make a decision, right? But, it, but of course, at the end of the day, I really appreciate what you said. You need to first to really define what the problems you want to work on. And this is actually, if you look at the, again, Harvard Data Science Review, we have, uh, we, we, we have a, a article by a philosopher. She wrote about, there's no such thing called a raw data. What, what she meant is that by the time you decide to collect the data, those that you already made some decision. Why you collect this data, you're not collecting other data, right? So that already is, is a selection. So basically, you know, every step you're doing this selection, you have potential could have a bias, could have overfitting. And so this is why you need to aware of this holistic picture, not just blindly say, oh, let me just crash numbers, you know, get the, get the answer. And I think that's probably, I don't have to say this for anyone in the business world. If you're a really good leader, you know you need to look at the things holistically, right? Anytime anybody give you, give you number, you should, the first question you should always ask, where did you get the data? Who collected? Why this was collected, right? Because that, that could usually answer a lot of your questions right there. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, I fully agree. It's, uh, yeah, quite often when I teach, uh, when I touch materials of machine learning, AI, the focus is step four. And quite often what we want to achieve with this data analysis was quite often it's uh, secondary, but uh, as you mentioned, the whole steps are important. So for example, um, some data scientists, because of missings, oh, this data point, we drop out. Right, it's terrible, right? That's <laughs> this, so it's this, because if we have a large, huge tons of data, but fair amount of data, they are missings, then we drop. Then the talk you gave us, you showed, shared with us, directly apply. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, right. Do you have any story you might think? Oh no, I have, I have tons of these stories. That's the, but, but I want to, I, I want to first emphasize the one point and, and, I, and I completely understand why, why number four becomes so important. Why number four so many people work on it. You know, number four is the easiest part because you can, it's the easiest part, you can put down mathematical formulas. You, you mean, and, and, and you, you, you can learn from textbook. You can learn from tutorials. It's a much, much harder to deal one, two, three. Because that, it's, it's a much more, you need a business experience, you need leadership experience, you need lots of experience, you need to make lots of judgment. It's much harder to teach. And also it's much harder to teach is because we don't teach those things. Most academias that we don't know how to teach those things. We don't have the experience to teach those things, right? I accumulate all these experience by working with, by working with many, many people, right? Many, many field, right? Even that, you know, I'm still learning. Like, you know, I, the example I just gave you about this, this uh, uh, psychiatrist study is giving me a very rich example to, uh, to teach because I learned, you know, you, you know, you know, from there. If you never do that thing, you may understand that order may matters, but you may not know how, how much, you know, you know, how much it matters, right? And uh, um, the, 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 the scariest thing you just mentioned about this, actually there's a term to it because whenever people see a missing data, they, 
the, the most common method, at least a while ago, is called a complete, complete case uh, analysis, right? You basically throw away any cases, you know, uh, with, that, with some missingness. Now, number one, you throw, throw away lots of data. Now, but if, you, if these missingness themselves are purely uh, random people, then by throwing them away, you only reduce the sample size, which increase your statistical error, but it does not increase your systematic bias. The real trouble is when you throw those people away, you know, you are throw away people who are the ones who will be able to provide all your, all your answers. That's a very biased sample, right? I give you another example. This is a, this is a really quite an interesting example. There was a study, they tried to, they trying to estimate how much money a doctor makes, the real doctor, not like us, you know, the, the, the medical doctor, okay? <laughs> so they want to estimate it, you know, like, like every professional, right? uh, how much a surgeon make, how much cardiologist make, how, you know, how much, you know, a, 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 you know, a physician, a, a, a generalist make. And uh, what's interesting is that these people doing these surveys, that they were smart enough, they kept a record, kept a word record, you know, because they do, uh, you know, these surveys usually, you, I mean, you do mail survey and most mail survey people don't respond, right? So they do phone call, they, they do follow up, you know, phone call. And somebody was smart enough to record uh, how many phone calls I had to make to reach a doctor, right? Okay. Later they, they found that is a very good predictor about how much money this doctor is making, right? <laughs> Because, because, the, because you know, the, the more number of phone calls it takes to get the doctor, the more, more money that doctor is making, statistically speaking. There's a regression, right? But why? Because the ones that are making money are busy. You know, they're, they're not sitting there waiting for your phone call, right? And if you call someone, they're just answering. That's probably is not a very busy one, right? Now, mm -hmm. if you did not understand those things, would you, would you, I mean, you would not even record like how many phone calls you're making, right? Because you say, why that data ma matters? So this is what I'm saying is that, you know, when you understand those things, when you collect data, you need to collect all the data, not just the, this is like collect what's called the metadata. It's not just the data you want to collect. You want to collect all the process. How did you get the data collected, right? Because those information can be incredibly, you know, important. It's a, it's a very much like, I used the uh, analogy. Um, it's like, you know, if you're a good detective, like, you know, if you're solving a murder mystery or something, you're not just looking for the evidence there. You're looking for the evidence that's not there and why something is missing, right? You know, it's, a, it, it, it's a much more important to say why something should be there that was not there being removed by whom, right? So you are not just look at something. So you're gonna take this holistic approach. So I think uh, doing data analysis, doing all this uh, AI, whatever you call it, is essentially is a detective job. Is you want to detect what the nature is telling us, right? Or, or what, you know, whatever, whatever the human behaviors are. And so I think if you, you just have to take this, take this holistic, uh, you know, holistic approach. Yeah, I have, over the years, I've collected zillions of these kind of, a, you know, bias. To, and in fact, to be honest, and it's almost like everything you're looking to, if you look carefully, you know, you know there's a problem. It's, a, it's extremely rare that you have a data is so clean to, you, you can analyze. And I always tell my students, all my collaborators, anytime you see a survey data that is no missing data, it's a complete, I can guarantee you, it's either, it's a fake data, or it's a simulated data, or somebody did lots of cleanup. That cannot possibly be a raw data. Okay, I just, I just don't. I have never encountered a, a real surveys that has hundred percent response. Everything's so clean. That, that that doesn't happen in real life. I see. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a because time. To, I want to move on to the next next question. So validation of report quality. Why I brought this question was quite often directors, managers, we only get the report. Yeah. We don't know what's going on, data analysis, step four, step three. What we get is a number. The, if we reduce price, the demand goes up this person or something like this. Yeah. That's a conclusion basically. But what kind of question can we ask to validate the quality of report? That's an excellent question. And I want to say first that uh, what I learned from that particular uh, article in, uh, in a Harvard Data Science Review, uh, 
is by the by these two uh, uh, Ula. What's her, her name? I mean, I can. It, it's it's in the last issue. Uh, uh, one of the one one of the author I think the name is Dirk Dirk Hoffman. They wrote this article about in a in a business organization, you need these uh, people essentially doing that kind of translation for you. All right, you have data scientists. Okay, typically you know out of the schools or done. They know how to run machine learning, do all this analysis, right? They are the ones that may or may not really understand the business need to write a report to give you the most relevant numbers and tell you the stories that you need to know. It's not like they try to hide anything from you. They just don't know what, what you're looking for, okay? On the other hand, the, that, then you have like, for example, like, you know, business leaders, right? And they know what they want, but they don't really understand how these things was done, right? They will just get these numbers. And, and, and if the data scientists are not the right person to explain those things. So what they suggest is a company should have started having these people, what they call the AI strategists. But you need to hire these AI strategists or, you know, or, or, or these data strategists. These are the people that really understand the both sides. They basically serves as, as the connectors. They will be going back and forth. So by the time you see the report, okay, your feedback is already there because you say, here's what I wanted. Is there somebody going to translate it for you? But that actually, I think, is really quite important because it's essentially is um, is 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 just like you know. It, uh, let me take a this you know you know this may or may not be may or may not be the right analogy. That if you think about in you know in the medical profession, right, you got to see a doctor just in in few minutes. There are a lot of things the nurse is following up, right? The nurse going to you between the patient and the doctor, translate the language that what you need, and like working with you, right? Because you don't get to see that. That, uh, that and so so you need someone like that to help you to to do that to the translation. Now, if you don't have those uh, those people, first I would encourage if you can hire start to hire those people. If you don't, then the most important thing I think is really first that you you need to build you need to build the trust uh, you, you you need to build the trust with uh, you, you know with each other. You need to find a way to we you need to find a way to 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 uh, to communicate. Uh, there's an article again in Half Day Science Review by, by Katie Malone, I think it was two issues ago, specific talk about how data scientists and the business leaders should have communicated with each other. Even the metric, you need to find a common metric because you know, a statistician or data scientist may give you say, oh, no, it's a mean square error, it's a variance, it's a, it's a correlation, right? But that may not be the metric that the uh, business leader cares about, right? The business leader may, you know, may care about is the is the bottom line, like you know, is the profit, is is how much time, you know, I say, right? So you need to find a ways to find the metrics that can be realistically assessed, but it's also understandable, you know, by you know, by the you know by the other side, and uh, that will take uh, take a process of uh, having conversations, you know, to to understand to understand each other. I think that it will be an effort by both sides. Data scientists need to learn how to communicate in the most uh, you know, compact way, but engaging way, finding good knowledge, just like what I did. Like if you try to explain to people this mixing, it may or may not work, but tell them like, you know, like a tasting soup, okay? That's some knowledge you know, people, people can understand. And, and, and I, would, I would say for, you know, you know, for, the, for the business leaders, you should learn something about the basic statistics. Some, I mean, you know, that's important. You should understand uh, there's quantity like correlations, variance, like what they measure. So you will not be blindsided. You will not take any, oh, this is AI, this is something important. And those things are not hard to learn, particularly that you will have an advantage because you have a real use of, of them. So you can learn in the real content. Now finding like, you know, Somebody here like yourself, you can you can help to teach those things, right? Because you understand both sides. You're teaching those things. You you can teach in this kind of real content. And I think uh, I I can't emphasize enough about the importance of the communication here. But a communication takes both sides' effort, and uh, it takes practice, and takes find a common metrics that both sides can appreciate, evaluate, and understand it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very important and uh, we are learning a lot from you and we, I want to continue discussion with you, conversation with you by myself, but there are a lot, some questions from the yes. audience. Yeah, we One of answer. them is, thank you very much for your insightful talk, Professor Men. I wonder if 
the, they try to account this type of errors in the evaluation of effectiveness, effectiveness, efficacy of the vaccines, including the recent COVID-19 vaccines. Can you please share your thought? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, first, thank you for that really important question. Uh, let me answer this way that, you know, I have not been involved in any of these, uh, these vaccine studies, so I do not know whether they take them into account or not, but I certainly wish they do. Okay, number one, that they, you, you know, they, I mean, they, they really should. Um, but I think that there is an article that I, I certainly encourage you to read, which is the one that I, I, I actually mentioned by, uh, by, Dempsey, uh, by Walter Dempsey. He basically took my formula. In my formula, I was just talking about, uh, you know, testing positive or negative, right? You, you apply that. But then he further developed the formula into situation because every time you have a test itself, the test results is a, it can be false positive, false negative, okay? So now you're, now the thing you get itself, the measurement itself, when it says positive, it may not be real positive, right? So, so now he developed, you should read the article, it's actually gets more complicated. It's more than three terms. It will have a four term because there is a correction term to the data quality due to the defect of the test, okay? You, you remember I talk about, uh, difficulty, quantity, data quantity, data quality. But if the, if, the, if the measurement itself has problems, then there's additional deterioration of the quality due to the measurement itself, okay? So, there, there, so you have another term there. Uh, what's interesting is that this, this gets very complicated. It turns out that sometimes you have this situation like a negative times negative become positive. So he discovered you have these situations like you know, there, there are defects this way and there are defects that way that actually turn out to be okay. Now that, that just makes things a lot, lot, lot more complicated. So uh, what I'm saying is that people are start studying those things and I think uh, it's gonna take a long time, but uh, I think the simple awareness, start to ask this question will be very important. And I also welcome any of you who are interested in doing this kind of research. I think that this is a really relatively new field because it's about quantifying the quality of the data. And, and I also want to emphasize that from very beginning, as, uh, um, as we all recognize that the, unlike the quantity of the data is defined by the size of the data, the quality of the data is determined by what do you use the study for? It could be, a data could be very high quality for one study, a terrible study, a terrible quality for a different study. So you can see that is why, it's just like the problem difficulty there. So there are another component in the data quality is the purpose of the study, why you're using this data for. So, uh, I mean, this is a very long answer to, to your question, but a short, the short answer is I don't know, but I certainly think that that should be done. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question, but because the time is running up, I just want to ask this, uh, I want to ask this question. Sure. Uh, in your opinion, are the current challenges in front of data science? Because we are leading experts, one of the leading experts of data science field. We really want to learn what is the ideal direction of this data science field? And uh, what is missing? What is expecting coming up? And uh, can you share your opinion? Yeah, uh, two parts, and I, I probably don't have the slides. I've been, I've been saying that uh, data science 3.0, if we, if we think we already point 0, 0.0, it should emphasize a lot more about a, first the data quality than data quantity. Second, emphasize a lot more about data processing than data analysis. This is for, for obvious reasons. And uh, the other thing I think is a really important, which uh, was probably the silver lining of this COVID-19, is that we need to start thinking about uh, what people call like a rapid uh, data science response team. Because the problem is now lots of problems happen in real time. You know, you don't have enough time to do simulation, to learn patterns, because people are dying like in, in, in those pandemics. Like, so we don't really have a very good way of collecting high quality data in this kind of a pandemic situation. We have lots of data out there. 
the, the data quality I can tell you is terrible. Not people want to make them terrible because people, everybody's so busy saving life, do all those things. They can collect whatever they can, they can, can have, right? So, so there are a lot. So, what will be that kind of, uh, you know, like a hospital, you have, a, you have ER, you have emergency rooms, right? You know, they have, they have protocols, like say, you know, how do you save life? What do you do, right? Like in data science, we just start doing that. We, we, we don't have, so again, I want to really, uh, uh, this is a perfect uh, uh, closing or, or, or advertising for data science review. In the January issue that we're gonna have uh, an, uh, uh, an article uh, called the uh, data science in the time of pandemic. It's gonna be a discussion article talking about um, like how do we do data science in those kind of time where there's no perfect answer. There's always uh, a lot of trade-offs. Uh, you know, I, we didn't have time to talk about these, these are big problems, data privacy, uh, you know, the trade-off between data privacy, data, you know, data utility, there's this whole uh, contact tracing was incredibly important, but it's also incredibly invaded people's privacy. And so, so there's all these, uh, you know, all these issues. Uh, I think it's a great time for anyone to be a data scientist. And I also want to emphasize because it's so broad, uh, you don't need to be a mathematician or to be a data scientist. There are many different entry points that uh, uh, from data SX to all, all kinds of things we just talked about today. So. Thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate your time, and your insightful talk and suggestions, advices to us. On behalf of the co-organizers and the audience. I really want to thank you, Shaoli. Thank you very much. And uh, before I close, the everyone join our event. I really, we want to thank everyone so that this event happened. And we really appreciate everyone's participation contribution to this event. And uh, before I close, I really want to thank Shelly again. And thank you very much, Shelly, today. And uh, you, it's a time, is a uh, night time? Yep, no, it's entirely fine. That, uh, I <laughs> oh, appreciate Thank, thank you yeah, very I much. Appreciate I appreciate the, the, this opportunity. Uh, let me just say one more thing that uh, oh, yeah, I please. saw there's, a, there's a one question there about the statistical cause inference related to everything here. I don't have time to talk about, but I want to say, uh, my article uh, I, I published in 2018, that's the part one. The part two article is going to touch on this issue. So oh. I'm trying to finish the, uh, hopefully in the, in the next month or so. And I hope that someday maybe you invite me again that I can, you know, I can talk yes. about that. Yes. And I hope that uh, we will see each other in person. And I want to thank everyone uh, uh, for joining. And I just want to advertise Harvard Data Science Review one more time that uh, it's entirely free. Uh, please get the words out. I need everybody's help to read it, to uh, give us suggestions. And if you're interested to write an article about, you can send me, send me a proposal. We have a review pro process, but uh, the, uh, the Harvard Data Science Review is, uh, is aimed to what we call the uh, data science for everyone and uh, everything data science. So I hope that you will enjoy that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, everyone. We want bye -bye. to close the event. See you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.